and ready for what CNBC called the Bitcoin Oracle. Our next speaker is a serial entrepreneur. He's a shark on Shark Tank South Africa. And he's the CEO and co-founder of the blockchain identification verification platform, Civic.com. All the way from San Francisco, please welcome with me, Vinny Lingham. Okay. Morning, everyone. <coughs> I see this is going. There we go. So, um, yeah, great. It's great to be in Zurich. Uh, it's the first time in about eight years. Uh, great being back. Weather's not that great, but uh, it'll do. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, decentralized identity and just quick, a bit about myself. Um, co founder CEO of Civic Technologies. It's a decentralized um, identity platform. We did one of the first ICOs uh, last year. Did anyone participate in that? Anyone here? Yeah, a couple of hands, great. Um, and I think we were one of the pioneers of how to do it in the right way. We didn't, you know, we didn't offer discounts, we didn't do anything crazy. Uh, it was very much a, a paving the way of doing um, these sorts of offerings. Um, yeah, early, uh, I'm an early investor in a lot of Bitcoin companies. So going back to 2000 and, uh, 2013, um, you know, it was back in the, the days where, you know, Blockchain and Bitcoin was kind of dead, and there were very few people out there, angels writing checks for, uh, for companies. And I came across companies like Filecoin and Definity, uh, invested in those, BitGo as well. Uh, and uh, it's been an interesting ride to see how things have changed from 2013 to today. So, trust. I think, you know, when you look at, at this rope, one of the things that strikes me is the physics of it, right? You, when, if you're holding a piece of rope and obviously there's upper, up and lower bounds of weight, uh, you, you know it's not going to break because you trust the physics behind it. Blockchains are very similar. You're trusting the math behind blockchains. And so one of the things we find in society is that trust doesn't scale well. Robin Dunbar, uh, came, a social scientist, came up with, a, with Dunbar's number. And basically, after you get past 150 people, trust breaks down. So within your social circles, you trust your family, you know, 5, 10, 15 people, immediate family, you trust them really close, really, um, you know, there's a high degree of trust there, and as it gets to 50 people, you trust a little bit less, and when you get to your outer room of your social circle, around 150, you, you stop trusting people as much as you would. Strangers, um, obviously, there's very little trust there. But in society, what happens is when we get past those social circles, you move out of the village, what happens is you need institutions, you need contracts, government, governments, and, uh, and institutions like, you know, for example, banks, etc., that make sure that you can trust people as a, as a trusted third party, so you can work through third parties um, to, you know, endure trust. And so, when you look at the entire world, how do you start trusting strangers around the world? It's, it's not possible today without using a trusted third party, and this is what blockchains have, 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 have solved for us. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, when he, uh, when he mined the first block, he put a reference into the uh, 3rd of January 2009, the, the Times article about uh, the chance on the brink of second bailout for banks, basically how the banking sector was falling apart and what we believe that the dream was for Bitcoin and eventually blockchain technologies, how we can effectively remove these trust barriers. Unfortunately, eight years later, we still have the same problem, um, just different types of breaches of trust. Now we're seeing user identity data being leaked, being sold, etc. cetera. Um, we had, you know, in, in eight years of, of or nine years of Bitcoin and blockchain, uh, we still haven't solved that problem yet. But when we look at trust, one of the things about tr trust which is really important is, is changing the mindset. If you have a piece of gold, and you know, historically, thousands of years, gold has acted as a medium of exchange because people trust that the physical properties can't be replicated uh, or duplicated, right? Uh, you know, alchemists have tried unsuccessfully over the years. And, and so a piece of gold was valuable, and it, it's just easy for the mind to understand. You, you transfer this physical gold from one person to another, the person transferring it doesn't have possession of it. Alex did a good job explaining it in his talk. Um, you know, and that's the, so physical commodities are easy to trust. Uh, governments and banks, uh, you know, I think in society we've got to the point where we trust them 
to an extent, and there, is, there are institutions that allow us to do transactions with third parties we don't know, and there is some trust there, but we are still trusting a third party. With blockchains, you're trusting digital commodities, you're trusting the blockchains, uh, the math behind the blockchains, and that's really what it boils down to. Do you trust the math behind Bitcoin, behind Ethereum, et cetera? And there are a number of different blockchains out there today. A couple of years ago, it was just largely Bitcoin and a few others. Um, there's, you know, there's thousands today. And they, they, there's some with special use cases um, around uh, you know, Internet of Things, etc. Identity is one. And uh, I want to chat more about uh, that in a second. Do I have a timer here, by the way? Sorry. <laughs> Looking. Is there a timer? No? Cool. Just checking. Sorry. <laughs> um, the, so, what are the unique characteristics of, of a blockchain? So, th these are the five things which I think are really important for us to understand. Um, transparency and immutability. Once a transaction is committed to a blockchain, it's on a public ledger, it's public and available for everyone to see, and it's immutable, it can't be changed, which means it's cryptographically secured by the math behind it. With, uh, with examples of, of blockchains like Bitcoin, it's, de it's very decentralized. There are thousands of nodes around the world, so you, you can't tamper with the records, and the data integrity is really high. And the blockchains are different from databases. Databases are highly centralized. There are, databases are more cost efficient, but um, there is a lot of cost reduction if you can remove third parties by using blockchains. So what does that mean for identity? Um, one of the problems in society today, and those of you who've opened up accounts at multiple cryptographic ex crypto exchanges, you know, you have to provide your ID, your passport, utility bills, um, a lot of this information to every single site that, that, that you go to multiple times. The data, where does the data sit? Uh, it gets emailed to a back office somewhere in, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, who knows where, Asia, etc. These documents get leaked, identity theft happens. It's a big problem. How do you cryptographically uh, secure your data. When you're going through customs and, and immigration, they want the physical documents because there's watermarks, there's, there's seals on it. They, they feel they can trust these documents issued securely. But we're in 2018 right now. Uh, it, it's kind of weird where we haven't really moved, except for a few countries, to the digital age of digital documentation. And that's what blockchains can help because help with, because blockchains basically have this, a decentralized network where you can validate that the data is correct. So I want to show a quick video here. I hope it works. This sound? And show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample of vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh. Oh. I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. 
So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. I'm, I'm not sure how safe you feel about your cell phone accounts anymore. So. At Civic, what we're trying to do is digitize all this information, and we're moving, we, we believe the world, the future of the world is not about information that you know, it's about um, a key-based future. And when I say a key-based future, having the private keys that prove you own a piece of data. If that was the case, that phone call could never have happened, because it, it, it's, you'd have to have the, the, the private keys sitting in a crypto wallet on your device um, to access any account, and no one else could override that. So you really are in control of your information. So if we can get to a point in this world where we can digitize birth certificates, death certificates, um, you know, driver's licenses, passports, the whole lot, and have that information on your phone, uh, you could then assert your identity wherever you are and, and be able to use that information securely and no one else could, could impersonate you. And we're very close to this. The issue isn't really the tech, it's the acceptance of the tech. The technology exists, we're already doing this today, but getting it rolled out to the point where, where governments will accept it at the border, where banks will accept it to open up accounts online, uh, is a challenge. But as we're seeing more and more identity fraud happening, more and more of your information being stolen and used, I think we get the picture that this is going to be the way the, way the world moves going forward. If it's as simple as going online to the dark web, buying your information and being able to use it, or socially engineering it that way, it's just not secure anymore. And you know. I got to a point in the US where I was, I mean, a couple of years ago, I never gave up my social security number. I was really paranoid. Now I just give it out everywhere. Like, you know, why? Because it's already out there. It's been hacked by Equif at Equifax and a couple other places. Someone already wants it. You can go buy it for 20 bucks on the dark web. So what's the point? It, knowledge and inf information needs to change. So knowledge-based authentication needs to change. If you know something, it doesn't really mean that you are that person or you, or, or you own that information. But if you have the private keys attached to that information where there's a hash on the blockchain and it's distributed and you can prove ownership, uh, then I think we're going to be making progress in identity. So quickly, our, our marketplace is just opening up to allowing companies and partners, governments to validate your information, your identities, and allowing you to use it elsewhere. Uh, that's really what the token's used for. Uh, it's a very secure, private way of, of exchanging information. There's issues like correlation risk where you don't want, uh, if you open a bank account, you don't necessarily want the bank to know what other accounts you have, but they need to be able to validate your ID, and our token allows you to do that. So the, the benefits we see of a decentralized global digital ID, and, and the number of players out there you're trying to do this, and I think there'll be some standards that emerge that we'll all uh, uh, adopt to in the future, is that I think the, the, the vision is we want you, you to own your own identity. We want people to own their own identities on their devices and be able to assert their identity. It, if we could do that, no one could ever impersonate you. Um, you know, moving away from legacy 2FA where it's an SMS. <laughs> can you imagine? She can access all his accounts, uh, literally, um, by doing password resets on email addresses, you know, using, the, 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 using a, uh, he, you know, getting a SIM swap now from his uh, mobile provider, being able to pass it, reset, steal his bitcoins, whatever else. It's kind of a scary, scary world there. Um, also, having no central point of failure is important. When you have the hashes distributed through a node network, um, you can effectively be guaranteed that there's no party that can go down. You can always validate someone, someone's keys against the nearest node. Also, uh, with scalability, if you are a big company, you can run your own node to validate um, private keys. So it's a really interesting way of, of decentralizing identity where there's no single point of failure and there's no one company holding it. In Civic's case, we don't store the information. We have no, we, you know, we could be holding 100 million people, we, we could have validated 100 million people's identities and not be storing any data on our service. So if we get hacked, your information is safe because it's on your devices. If you get hacked, that's one person, not the entire system failing. And so you know, this is, uh, you know, what we're basically doing is making it easy for you to uh, set up IDs on your phone, scan your information, your, your passport, do a selfie, verify the information, log in, open up new accounts, et cetera. It's reusable, um, so you don't have to keep scanning information when you open up multiple accounts at crypto exchanges, et cetera. Uh, and just a quick... Uh, in a world oh, with... Oh, I'll, just go, I'll just end with a quick video on, on, on Civic and the vision that we have, uh, and thank you for your time.
In a world with more and more identity theft, a trusted identity is increasingly important. That's why Civic created the Secure Identity Platform. It's a bit like a digital wallet that bridges your physical and cyber credentials. To see how it works, let's meet Janice. Janice is going on a trip, and she needs to identify herself several times along the way, starting with the purchase of a plane ticket. Janice's travel booking service is a Civic business partner, so they simply send Janice a QR code to request her information. Janice provides the requested information directly from her mobile device, where that information is stored fully encrypted. Now Janice can use that same device to verify her identity at the airport check-in counter, at the security check, and when she gets to her hotel, using her fingerprint each time to prove that she is the owner of that data. This voluntary exchange of data happens directly between Janice and any organization that requests her information, like a hotel or a bank. When there is a request for additional data, it gets added to her Civic app, and she builds up trust in her digital identity. Each organization receiving her data independently validates her identity on the blockchain. That means Janice's information is trusted, and she can have the low friction experience she deserves. Contact the Civic team to learn how you or your business can benefit from the Civic Secure Identity Platform.